great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us for the How to Write Your First Science Fiction Fantasy Novel Series. I'm Kaylee Webb, Marketing Manager here at Orbit, and I am thrilled to be your moderator this afternoon. So just a quick rundown on the event. It's going to feature a 30 to 40 minute conversation among the panelists and is going to conclude with an audience Q&A. If this is your first time using Crowdcast, you can enter questions via the Q&A function. Um, that's the button with the little question mark on the right of the screen. Vote on your favorite questions because we'll start with the highest voted ones during the Q&A portion. And if you have to step out or miss the end of it, the replay will be available after, after the event. So be sure to rewatch and share with your friends, family, or anyone you know who is remotely interested in writing in any way. So today's panel is all about taking inspiration from classic stories. And we're joined by four of our fantastic Orbit authors who I will introduce now. First up, we have Chelsea Abdullah who is the author of The Stardust Thief, released by Orbit in spring 2022. Next up is Sharon Emmerichs, the author of Shield Maiden, which released just a few weeks ago from Red Hook. We have Emery Robin, the author of The Stars and Dying, which released from Orbit in fall 2022. And then last but certainly not least is Lucy Holland, the author of Sister Song and the upcoming Song of the Huntress, which is out from Red Book in spring 2024. And so now for the fun part, let's begin with the questions. So first, this is for everyone. What's your quick pitch of your latest book or series? And what is the book's relationship to classic stories, myth, or history? Um, let's start with Lucy, because you're the first one I see. Hello. <laughs> So um, my upcoming book, Song of the Huntress, uh, it uses Celtic mythology to reimagine the myth of the wild hunt. It recasts Hurla, who is the leader of the hunt, um, into an Iceni war chief sworn to Boudicca, who travels to the other world to make a pact with the king of the other world. Um, instead of returning with the power uh, to defeat the Romans and to save her tribe, she finds instead that centuries have passed in the mortal world, Boudicca and her tribe are long dead, and that she herself is cursed to ride eternally. Um, so the action is set in 8th century Wessex, uh, in the same world space as Sister Song. Um, great, um, why don't we um, go to Chelsea next? Hi everyone, um, I'm Chelsea, author of The Stardust Thief, um, which is the first book in the Sansi trilogy. Um, I like to say that this book, um, or my basic pitch for this book, um, is a merchant, a prince, a thief, and a djinn go on a quest to find a mythical magic lamp. On the way, they uncover um, a lot of political machinations, nefarious magics, and unfortunately, a lot of personal drama and trauma. <laughs> um, this is a very personal story for me, um, inspired by the versions of the Thousand and One Nights tales I grew up with, um, along with, in general, a lot of the oral stories that I grew up with as an American Kuwaiti writer. Great. Okay, and Marie? Uh, hi, I'm Emery Robin. I've written The Stars Undying, uh, which is a retelling of the lives and loves of Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, and Mark Antony in space. Uh, and right now I'm working on the sequel to that. The first one was more or less the period that the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar takes place over. Now we're moving on to Antony and Cleopatra uh, for all of you fans of lesbian Antony, which we've got. That sounds incredible. And Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Emmerichs. I wrote Shield Maiden, which is a retelling of um, the last sort of third of the Beowulf poem story. And my my quick pitch really was, um, this is not your English teacher's Beowulf. <laughs> this this um, rendition or reimagining of it, um, it changes quite a lot of the uh, the original story, though it does keep with the sort of narrative arc of how it goes, but my my general premise was to kind of point out that stories stories tend to lie, and so there are quite a few surprises um, 
within for people who are familiar with the poem, but it's also, I made sure to make it readable for people who have never read the poem at all, so. Great, so yeah. everyone be sure to um, check out these fantastic novels and we're going to keep rolling. So Chelsea and Emery, your books are more on the inspiration side of the spectrum. How did you, decide what to keep and what to discard and what are some examples of some ideas that were inspired by old stories and how did you tweak them to fit into your story? Uh, okay, I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, so for me, um, I actually did not set out with the intention of using very specific stories. Um, the Stardust Thief, like I said, is a, it was a very personal story for me. Um, I wrote it sort of as an ode to oral storytelling in general, um, but also to the stories that I had been born and raised with. Um, I first started to conceptualize it during my, I think it was like first, second year of undergrad. Um, and it was my first time away from home from Kuwait for a long while. And um, I just really missed home. I missed, you know, so many elements of the culture that I had just taken for granted growing up there. Um, and so many of the stories I had taken for granted growing up there. And so I had this idea in my head of doing something um, that was almost like a love letter to those stories, but I didn't really know what those stories were. Um, of course, the general premise of these characters going on a quest to find a magic lamp um, that kind of occurred to me pretty early on because I, this had the feeling of a quest story. Um, and so that came into play a lot earlier than the other tales that are sort of incorporated into the book. Um, but for me, it was less so, um, it was less so thinking of discarding things mm -hmm. and more elements and concepts coming into play as the story unfolded. Um, it's especially interesting with A Thousand and One Nights because it's a collection um, so to tell a re to, to write a retelling of the Thousand and One Nights, you would have to retell the whole collection. Um, so I didn't do that with the Stardust Thief. Um, I just had certain central elements and concepts um, that came into play. Um, so things that people will probably find familiar: uh, the Magic Lamp, um, the Forty Thieves <laughs> make an appearance, uh, but they are very, very different in my story. Um, they are a band of gin murderers. Uh, so very different kinds of thieves. Um, you also have the framework story comes into play in some way. Um, one of the main characters is the son of a storyteller um, who told stories to the Sultan to sort of heal his heart after these wife killings. Um, so you see that echo from the Thousand and One Nights. Um, but that is sort of incorporated into the history of the world. Um, so that's kind of how I dealt with or handled all of the different inspirations in my book. Um, they're just sort of little elements, little things, little nods um, to different tales that take on a new life in the story that, you know, I ultimately ended up with. Wonderful. I think I... I sort of went the opposite way. I intended to be a lot more faithful to the text than I actually mm -hmm. ended up being. Uh, and of course, you know, I had the big benefit of not, of, uh, I would say not working with the text, but in reality, what I was working with was, you know, hundreds and thousands of texts. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about Shakespeare, we're also talking about Plutarch, we're also talking about like, oh, you know, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, we're talking about all of the different ways that people have seen and interpreted Cleopatra over the years. Uh, and so when um, what got me, I won't say what got me interested in Cleopatra, but really reignited my childhood interest in Cleopatra, uh, was the Stacey Schiff biography, Cleopatra Life, because she's got a lot of very interesting things to say about, uh, the propaganda that Cleopatra put out herself and also was mm -hmm. shaped by before and after her death. Uh, and so the things that interested me about Cleopatra and that made me want to start exploring the Mediterranean this time was like someone texted me the other day and said, oh, you know, I was at a museum and uh, and looking at the history of all of this. And I was like, oh, this is like the stars undying, but that's not like the stars undying. <laughs> okay. Uh, and one of those things was, um, was, oh, you know, in the stars undying, Egypt isn't Rome's breadbasket. Uh, so that's different. And that's true. Uh, but that is something that I wanted to 
find a way to convey because that's something that's very important about the Egypt Rome imperial client mm-hmm. kingdom relationship at this time this like power dynamic that's you know uh important in the story and also kind of important romantically uh and so what I've got is you know a big ocean full of sunken treasure that no one can bring up uh except maybe the Romans who have the equipment to do it but the Egyptians don't which is sort of like very sort of like how in real life Egypt had you know all of this grain all of this wealth but they were also in huge huge debt to Rome uh because of the imperial factors going on at that time I and so I do a lot of things that seem to me to make very logical sense uh (laughs) and then I end up at a place where um you know, I want to convey that Cleopatra feels very connected to Alexander the Great, which she was. She had his corpse in her backyard. Uh, but what I end up doing is I end up giving her an AI pearl by Alexander the Great that talks to her into her ear. Uh, and in this way, I think fantasy and sci-fi can be really, really helpful in allowing us to talk simply about very complicated things using these concepts like ghosts or or robots or uh, AI um, that in real life might be economic factors or social factors or political factors that we can sort of make more tangible uh, through magic or through technology. Wow, the research process for both of you must have been so amazing. Just a little bit. (laughs) Well, okay. So we um, talked more of inspiration. Now, Sharon and Lucy, your titles are more on the retelling side of the spectrum. So how did you approach planning your novels when parts of the plot were already set? Well, for me, um, I'm an English professor and I teach Beowulf all the time in my classes. And every time I would, I would teach it, I was always left with these questions that the poem never answered. And it frustrated me. And so, for example, um, there's a, a, what, six lines of the poem where this nameless slave is exiled from his master's house. And he wanders in the wilderness, falls into a crevasse, finds a huge dragon's hoard steals a goblet and takes it back to his master, hoping to be let back in. And I always wondered, who, what is this dude's story? Who is this nameless slave? What did he do to get exiled from his master's house? Why did he snatch a goblet of all things? And I was just really intrigued by this incredibly minor little character who's mentioned and then tossed away, but who's an incredible catalyst for this moment in, in the story. And so I decided that I really wanted to write a novel that tells that story, that tells his story, um, that fills in some of those uh, gaps that the poem doesn't, doesn't address. And then once I got that idea, I realized, oh, there's lots of gaps in this story. Like, where are all the women? Where are all of the... Uh, where's all the diversity? Where, where are all of the disabled characters? Where are all the people of color. And so that really sort of launched me into one of the um, major uh, sort of themes or or ideas behind my story, which does follow the narrative arc of, of the last third of Beowulf pretty, pretty closely, even though um, I do make some significant changes. But what I really ended up doing was elevating those voices that we don't hear um elevating those voices that are silenced or that are subsumed underneath the heroes of the tale and that gave me actually a lot of leeway and a lot of wiggle room to uh, create some new fun connections to the poem itself great and you also answered both of my follow-up questions so lucy (laughs) Okay, I'll try not to answer the follow-up question. <laughs> um, I shall keep this short. Um, well, no, just Sister Song uh, was 
based on a ballad called the Trois Sisters. Um, and ballads generally only cover the bones of the story. I mean, by their nature, they're songs. They don't go on and on and on. I mean, Trois Sisters has between seven and ten verses, um, and some are abridged even more than that. So, you know, if you strip like that away, kind of all you've got really is the rivalry between two sisters. Um, the, the big denouement of the ballad, which is the whole kind of murder and, and the, the, the bone harp, like this, this stuff happens quite soon into the ballad. And when you're trying to write like, a, you know, a, a ballad into a novel, um, you know, novels have different structures. I couldn't do that. In fact, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to because the, the murder, the so-called murder, this, this terrifying showdown between the two sisters, that just doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, it takes, it took a lot of time spent with the characters. It took a lot of time for me to build their world, to figure out where the tensions were coming from until I could get to that scene. And that scene happens three quarters of the way through the novel. So really, even though, you know, it's a retelling, it's a re, I like to call it reimagining because so much imagination <laughs> goes into this. Um, Actually, when it comes down to it, you know, there are only very few parts of the plot that are set. Um, yeah, I really wanted to do the bone harp. As soon as I, I heard that, I thought mm -hmm. I've got to do the bone harp um, because that's just gross and also absolutely fascinating. Um, with the new book, it's a little bit different because I uh, possibly stupidly decided to tell the story after the end of the myth. So um, one of the conversations I had with my editor um, when I, I'd written the first draft, it didn't work. Um, and we, we threw it out quite quickly that, that this idea that I could retell the myth, you know, from the very beginning. So like go back to, you know, the, the Iceni, the Roman invasion, look at Boudicca, look at Herla, figure out why she went to the other world. But if anyone's familiar with the with the wild hunt myth, it it's bleak. It's bleak, you know. It ends it ends badly. Um, and I thought I I don't think that it could really work as a novel. So um, I decided to do the much harder thing of uh, picking up where the story leaves off, uh, which um, gave me a lot of freedom. But it was also you know you I find myself back in the wilds of oh god I haven't even got a skeleton this time to follow. I really am on my own and. You know, I've got to do a lot of plotting, which is my number one hate. <laughs> which is a great segue into my next question for both you and Sharon. How do you approach planning your novels where parts of the plot are already set or you are pulling inspiration from? Um, <clears throat> I'm in a very similar situation to Lucy. My, my first book followed the text pretty closely in a lot of ways. Um, I'm writing the second one now, which takes place after the, the poem has ended. So I'm, I'm in completely uncharted territory, um, having to create the story and everything myself. But for, the, for, for Shield Maiden, um, it was... I, I knew I had to bring new stuff in. I knew I couldn't just retell a story that everybody read in high school and nobody ever wanted to read again. <laughs> that wasn't going to work. Um, so I, the difficult part for me was to make it recognizable uh, to the source material, but to make it original enough to be a new story, to be a, a, a fresh um, perspective. So the way I did that was, I, I, I tend to think in cinematic terms. My, my family is very movie oriented. My brother is a cameraman in Hollywood. My sister-in-law is a, an actress and a writer. And so I tend to think in cinematic terms. I, so I think of it as shifting the, the camera from like the main players, from Beowulf, from Weoston, from Grendel, you know, all of these onto the peripheral characters and telling the story from their point of view, which is going to be very different from the story that you get from a character like Beowulf. 
So we have a story from the point of view of a woman. Um, we have points of view from a slave. We have points of view from an African indentured servant. And the way that they see the story play out, the way that they um, see the events is, is not necessarily going to be the same story as we hear from like the titular characters or you know the 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 nobles who are um in power right so i kept most of the main plot points but i changed the perspective um yeah i mean changing the perspective is something that i do with all of my retellings, reimaginings, because that's, you know, that's the beauty of it, because it offers you a chance to do so. Like Sharon's already spoken about marginalized characters, marginalized voices, people who live in the shadows of these great stories who we didn't, didn't actually get to hear from. Um, so, you know, having, um, having a myth as a foundational text to then kind of build an, on top on it, it opens the door to so many opportunities um so you know yeah like I had to do a lot of world building for both of my books you know they needed these stories needed fleshing out with more characters um more well the setting obviously I write historical fantasy so his uh, the research and the setting for me is you know that's a that's a lot of work building that um external conflicts because you know, something like Sister Song, that was, it's quite a domestic story. It's its very much like the breakdown of a family unit. Um, but that's why it's so important to have these external conflicts, um, you know, that feed into this. So it, it builds the tension kind of slowly but surely. So um, in both books, I've, this manifests quite in, a, in quite a big way um, with the, the struggle between magic and religion. Um, so particularly Christianity, incoming Christianity was, uh, yeah, it, it's, it created a lot of, um, a lot of tension, a lot of conflict, um, a lot of, you know, it, it's basically taking over people's way of life and, and their spiritual beliefs. So, you know, uh, and obviously it comes with its own um, brand of morality. It comes with its own social obligations, its gender identities, its assumptions, you know, it puts, you know, there's everyone seems to have a role in this new religion. And those roles are very different from the religions that were followed before. Um, so, yeah, like, going back to calling it a reimagining, like, I, you, you have to do a lot of reimagining to, you know, to, to bring... To bring the stories to life in a way that hasn't been done before um yeah and I think that the historical fantasy element it just for me it it provides this kind of additional focus um it's great to be able to set like a more kind of mythological tale to ground that in a historical setting because then you can you know you can draw on things that are already there like Christianity like um the incoming Saxons and the loss of uh, a loss of cultural identity it's all very fascinating and I learned an awful lot about my own country embarrassingly <laughs> while I've been researching these books <laughs> Oh, wow, that's so incredible. Okay, so my um, last few questions are for the group. So feel free to jump in if you would like to answer and then um, answer things that other panelists have said. So everyone, what do you think about the idea that there are no new stories? Strongly disagree. <laughs> um, I'm, really, I'm really curious to hear what everyone else uh, thinks about this. Um, but my feeling is um, whenever you're crafting a narrative, you're constantly balancing new material with the familiar. Um, even when you're writing fantasy, you're trying to ground readers. You're trying to make your characters feel human um, so that they're relatable in some way. Like I, I'm not a sci-fi person, so I'm not you know, writing about like, you know, characters who are <laughs> from outside of this world. Um, but even then, like you're going to imbue those characters with qualities um, that allow them to be relatable in some way. And so I feel like storytelling generally, like it, we do, we use, we reuse certain things from story narratives 
um, because it's familiar to us. Like I think about tropes, for instance, a lot of people have a lot of feelings about tropes. Um, but the thing about tropes is that they're actually very necessary um, for genre, for age category. Like there are certain things you expect as, you know, probably a reader when you go into a certain narrative um, because you're reading a fantasy, because you're reading a romance, there's like staples of the genre. Um, so you go into that thinking like, you know, I'm a fantasy reader because I like to read so and so things. Um, so as a writer, you're constantly having to balance that. Um, there's this feeling of, okay, I'm writing in this genre. What are the things that people um, would expect? How can I twist that into a new way? Um, and I, I mean, I feel like you can even see this looking at, you know, the history of like oral, oral storytelling, for instance. Um, you see many folk tales across various regions um, that feel very similar. <laughs> I always think about, you know, Cinderella as one of the most like traditional ones that is in so many different cultures. Um, and you have this sort of central staple of, you know, here is this girl who um, loses a slipper, who meets this prince, yada, yada. You know, it has like this, this, this sort of familiarity to it. But the way that that story is told um, is different depending on the culture, depending on the context, depending on the storyteller. Um, so I always feel like even if you're using very familiar um, tropes or um, some people would call them cliches, um, but we are sort of dependent on those things as authors. And I think even as readers to kind of guide our way through books. Um, if you just, I don't wanna say wrote a completely new story, um, but like if you wrote something that was wildly, um, totally fresh, new, something that someone had never read before, um, which there are definitely stories out there like that, that blow my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did this author come up with this? It's, you know, amazing. Um, but at the same time, you also want to keep your reader rooted in place. Um, because, you know, I think especially in fantasy, like people have this feeling, um, that fantasy is just escapism, um, which yes, <laughs> there is an escapist element to it. I write fantasy because I like to escape into other worlds. Um, but at the same time, I think people come to fantasy um, for certain genre conventions, for certain tropes, um, certain characters, um, certain archetypes are very popular across the genre. So I think those are the things um, that people fixate on when they think about, you know, oh, there's no new stories because I'm seeing the same kind of character pop up. Um, and certainly the way that you write that character, the execution matters a lot, um, because if you are just writing a bunch of tropes on a page, um, that's fine. Um, you know, that it, it can be a good story. Um, but you have to be mindful of the way that you're using those tropes and what kind of story you want to tell. Um, but yeah, I personally have this feeling that um, anytime someone writes their own story, they are bringing something unique to that narrative. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not uh, going to reiterate all of that, but I completely agree that, yeah, you're absolutely, of course you're bringing something new to it. Like, to our sisters was written it's been around for 300 years has anyone written it like the way i've written it no no one has um it's it's you know maybe they will now and I, I would be very proud if if i started a tradition for that but um you know one of the reasons that i i focus on what i'm focusing on which is like reseeding queer identity and you know and sexual orientations and gender identity into historical settings. You know, this is one of the reasons I'm doing it because I feel like these stories haven't been told yet, even though mm -hmm. we may be familiar with the structure of them. We may be familiar with these tropes, these stereotypes. Um, these voices haven't been heard yet. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, what is originality when it comes down to it? I mean, yeah, we, we, we recognize certain tropes and stereotypes. That's why we pick up books, but, I don't see how you can kind of write, you know, not not bring originality into it just from being a unique person and just from your mm -hmm. unique experience. Um, yeah, I'm I'm all for um, you know saying that there is no story that you know like we haven't told it too many times. <laughs> I uh, I read tarot cards and I'm not a believer in psychic powers and I so if you are someone who does that. Uh, and you see people being, you know, deeply moved by you putting some cards on a table and telling them about their feelings, then kind of uh, you start to go like, are there really only 78 things that can happen to a person? Uh, and I think that's a little bit like 
human nature is not a hugely flexible thing. You know, it's been pretty consistent. Uh, there are variants in the human experience and every life is completely unique, but we are going to have shared elements. And I think when we talk about like, oh, there are no new stories, I think that we can sort of boil that down to, well, the the feelings and the human experiences that we share are, are, are not unique. Not, you know, like there is very little about us that is something that only we have experienced in the entire world. And yet we're all completely unique people. There's no person who's exactly like another person. Uh, and I think that's sort of the paradox of it is that you are working with like very, very old stories. And you know, there are these people who say like, oh, there are only six stories. Uh, but you also are, yeah, you, it is naturally going to be unique but because it's your voice, because it's you talking about the people you know, because it's you drawing from the experience you've got, uh, which is going to be a different experience than one that has ever been experienced. What is that quote? You're unique, just like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I, I, think, I, I... Sorry, go ahead. I, sorry, um... I, there's, I, I also think that it is like useful to familiarize yourself with your own genre, uh, because there's like a, a good Ursula K. Le Guin quote that goes around every so often about Harry Potter, where she says, everyone said Harry Potter was like the first time this had ever been done. It absolutely wasn't. People had done this a ton of times before, but people were not familiar with the fantasy genre. They thought this was like a totally new invention when it was, you know, a solid reinvention. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, a, a useful thing to keep in mind. For me, I, I, I always thought about it in terms of connection. How can I connect to my audience? And the audience that I wanted to connect to, um, I felt were the ones who didn't often get to see themselves represented in literature, didn't get to see themselves represented in fiction. Um, and so I, so again, I really wanted to like elevate those voices, but I also knew that I had to start with something that they could feel a sense of familiarity with. And I thought it was really important to, again, like reimagine those stories with them as the main characters, a disabled character, an African character, um, a, a, you know, low economic status character. And I think Again, I always come back to this idea of whose perspective are we looking at the story from? And, you know, I feel like there are so many stories out there with, you know, the identifiable main hero. Um, I want to write stories with the un unidentified hero. And that, I think, can create an entire new story from a very familiar story. And it's one where, you know, people out there, readers out there can can read it and say, oh, I, I identify with this. I, I understand this. I've lived this. I've, I've experienced this. And that's really, I think, what differentiates um, a new story from a retold story or from a reimagined story is you is who... who who will read this story and recognize themselves when they haven't had that experience reading very often before? I just, I want to add to that too, because I think it's such a good point. Um, that idea of accessibility and representation is so important. Like I think so often about canon texts and, you know, like what makes, what are the classics and like who determines what the classics are, um, you know? And uh, I mean, like, I think, you know, I grew up in Kuwait and um, but I went, I went to an American school. And so all of these texts that were being um, shown to us were all from the American curriculum. Um, and so the definition of classic is so different, you know, when you, you across cultures, across identities. Um, so to go back and be able to retell these stories so that other people can see themselves um, or to retell um retell stories that maybe are lesser known just all and you know but using familiar tropes um that make them accessible to a wider audience um i i just think that's it's one of the better things about being a writer um and it's just in general like looking at the state of fantasy now it's been so wonderful to see see you know more of these perspectives and more of these identities being represented on the page 
Absolutely. I struggle with that a lot because I'm a Shakespeare professor. So I, <laughs> I'm sort of steeped in the notion of the canon. I teach Shakespeare. I teach Chaucer. I te you know, I teach these main canonical uh, texts. And I've really come to, um, to struggle with that because I'm like, who decided that these were the voices? that everybody got to brand as canonical as as the default and so, down with the dominant narrative exactly <laughs> exactly so um so my the, the last few years i've really been pushing for a more globalized curriculum in in my university to broaden out what we think of as the canon and to take a much more global perspective and i i, I do that in my writing too um, I wanted to carry that over into my creative writing as well as in, as my scholarly writing. That's actually a great segue into my next question. So how can writers be sensitive when adapting stories that may be personally significant to some readers? You mean culturally? Yes, culturally or religiously. We've had some questions in the um, the chat that are similar as well. I think uh, if anyone else wants to jump in, jump in. Um, obviously, there's a lot of discourse about this and has been, you know, for the last 15 years and ongoing uh, versus from people who will get mad when uh, people talk about cultural appropriation and go, oh, you're not allowed to, to do cultural exchange. And like, everyone knows that's facetious. That's not what's going on. Uh, what we're talking about is like we talk about these canon texts, these things like these stories that are passed, you know, over to America and over to England, uh, from like think about the Aeneid, uh, which I have read and which is, you know, a part of the canon for me. What the hell does the Aeneid have to do with me? How is that part of my culture? It's not. You know, I'm a Ukrainian Jew. I don't speak Latin. I've never lived in Italy. No one I know has ever lived in Italy. Uh, but it's it's supposed to be this very, you know, this very racist idea of the Western inheritance because of the Roman conquest of Europe, because of the English conquest of the Americas, uh, because of the this violence with which this story has been carried throughout the world. Uh, and, and the story itself was Roman propaganda in the first place. Um, and on the flip side, we have stuff like uh, uh, a lot of cultural appropriation, a lot of like uh, Orientalism and a lot of retelling stories uh, from Asia and from uh, the indigenous people of the Americas and from Africa uh, that are, you know, that are being told by people who don't know shit about these subjects uh, and who are telling them badly. And I think it's useful to frame it less as, are you allowed, are you allowed to carry things over borders or whatever and just say, like, stories are you know, I don't like to say this, but stories are a commodity. Uh, they, they're they a commodity that's part of imperialism. They're exported and imported. The other commodities are important, imported and exported. They're used to further empire in the same way. They're not special in that way. I absolutely agree. And I was really concerned with the idea of colonialism and imperialism when I was writing my book. Um, because I, I always went back to the, the notion that who gets to tell the stories in these situations? It's the winners, right? What happens to those who were colonized? What happens to the stories of those uh, under imperialism? And I started looking at Beowulf as being a part of that imperialist movement. Um, and that completely changed the way I looked at the story. It was it was really incredible when I started looking at it that way. Um, obviously, Beowulf started in the oral tradition, and nobody really knows when it originated, but we know that it was written down in the 10th century, probably by a group of monks. Um, and they imposed a great deal of... Um, you know, Christian imagery, Christian language, biblical language into the poem when they wrote it down, which probably was not there in the original oral tradition tellings. And I had a, I had a choice. And when I was first starting this project, I really thought hard about whether I should include those elements in my own novel. And I decided not to. 
I decided, all right, I am not going to include any of the Christian elements. I'm going to make the, this is going to be a Saxon story. This is going to be a, um, well, of course it takes place in Geatland, but the, the tellers were Saxon and that's a whole can of worms of itself. But I made the deliberate decision to not include any of the, the Christian elements because I considered them imperialistic. I, I considered them a form of colonialism that I didn't want to include. I wanted to raise the voices of those who had been colonized. And um, and there was some, some, some and I understand that there might be some people who would be like, well, you're not being, you're not being faithful to the text then. And it's not, but, but it's not my, my intention to be faithful to the text. It's my intention to tell a story and to represent um, a culture and, and characters that I think um, are essential to the story. And so that's sort of where I make that differentiation there. Great. Thank you so much um, for those thoughtful answers. So um, before I jump into the Q&A portion, I just have one uh, last question for you all. What is your advice to writers who want to adapt elements of classical stories into their own works? Um, so my advice is don't be constrained by the narrative that you see before you. Um, look for the side characters in a story and learn from them. Um, they may have a lot to tell you about the more famous protagonists, the more famous faces that we're used to seeing and that everyone is familiar with. Um, another way of putting this is looking for the gaps between facts. Uh, if you're writing historical fantasy, there are a lot of gaps to exploit, um, mostly through the fact that we either have conflicting accounts of historical events or that some of our major primary sources are propaganda um hashtag anglo-saxon chronicle uh, <laughs> which is yeah we haven't changed very much um so yeah i i try to think of when you know when i've got i've got a piece of source material there i'm like what is it not saying um where are where are the gaps um what can i what can I come in and exploit uh, and, and maybe elevate as, as Sharon has been talking very eloquently about? <laughs> to add to I that, I would also say, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I already interrupted you, you go on. Okay, uh, to add, just a really quick comment. To add to that, I would also say, don't be afraid to monkey with the original story, to, to put your own um, perspective on it, to change, certain elements of it. Um, I was I was actually really worried when I first started this whole procedure that I was going to piss off my readers because uh, of some of the changes that I made to the original story. But by the time I finished it, I realized uh, my changes don't erase the original story. The original story is still there. People can go read Beowulf if they want to, and they, they still have the original. Um, Whatever it is that I write is not going to change that. I'm simply going to be adding to um, that body of, of work about that text. So don't be afraid to put your own personal spin and uh, imagination into your stories. Sorry, I mean, go ahead now. I'm done. Oh, yeah, um, I guess my, like, I feel like my advice has come from a place of love. I And I don't by that mean that you have to love the story exactly as it is. You have to think the text is, you know, perfect as it is. Uh, you shouldn't, ideally, but you should start by knowing why you love this text and what about that love you want to be in conversation with. Uh, and, and you know, and I think it is better if it comes from a place of, of not say, I love this hero and I want to, you know, have the hero. It can come from a place of, I really love this side character. Uh, and I, I want to know why I love him. I want to know why I'm digging out uh, what I love about him. And I want to know what about the language rings in my ears that makes me go, oh, I have to talk about this guy. Like, I, I, you're, you're not doing this because you hate what the story is. Maybe you do hate what the story is. That's fine. Um, but I think that hate is better if it comes from like uh, 
I have a complicated relationship with the Narnia books uh, because of the Christianity. And I, I loved Narnia so much. And that's sort of where my, all of the writing I'm going to do that's in conversation with Narnia comes from is, I really love this. Why did I love this? Why did I feel betrayed by it? Uh, and how can I be in conversation with that betrayal while not losing sight of the love? Uh, I was going to say spite writing is definitely a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess just to add on to that, um, this has basically already been said, but I think that idea of interest and like, why is it that you're personally drawn to a specific story? Um, and then measuring that with context as well. Um, thinking about like what, I mean, research, obviously, <laughs> like doing research on a specific story, making sure you understand like, um, who was who telling the story? Why were they telling the story? What did it mean at the time that it was being told? But then what does it mean now, I mean, like so many retellings now um, are taking classic stories and reframing them to be more modern, to have a more like modern sensibility. Um, very often we read like these classic tales and there are things that are like, oh, <laughs> that doesn't sit right with me nowadays. Um, so just sort of examining those different elements of the story. Um, and again, sort of being aware um, that stories don't really come from a vacuum, um, you know, like they're definitely spread across borders um, and people are retelling them all the time. Like it is a part of human nature to retell stories. Um, that's how these stories have lasted so long is being, you know, spread across the world. Um, you think about oral storytelling, you know, this has always been a thing um, and people have always been adapting stories in, you know, different ways. Um, but then when you are thinking like, you know, I, I don't handle retelling specifically, my book isn't a retelling, um, but, just trying to anchor a story in your own experiences, um, I think is the way to go. Um, in the sense of like, when uh, you as the writer will come into a story with your own perspective, with your own background. Um, and so just being aware of that when you are adapting a story, um, how does your, how does your background influence that? Um, and again, like, uh, if it's a story coming from a different part of the world, um, are you, is it, is it a trope that interests you? Is it an archetype? Um, and just, you know, sort of starting with that question, um, you know, it, do you have to retell that specific story or is there a specific element? Um, and just for me, um, I think a lot about like retellings versus reimaginings. Um, I personally am not a historical uh, fantasy writer. So like, you know, major kudos to everyone who is and does all of that research. Um, but I'm also very cognizant about that in my process, um, which is why when I write, I don't frame my my work as retellings. Um, so again, just being cognizant of the source material and, you know, being respectful of it, I think. Great. Wow, that was all really incredibly answered. So um, let's go into our audience Q&A now. Um, our first question is what is a story you would love to see someone adapt or retell or draw inspiration from that perhaps you don't want to tackle yourself? Hmm. Ah, uh, I would have said, um, you, does anyone, if anyone's familiar with the Mabinogion, um and the the stories of like Blodoweth, um who's the woman made of flowers and she gets turned into an owl and she's yeah if you read the owl service you'll also be familiar with this story uh yeah i i love um i love i love that myth i'm not sure i'm the right person to retell it i kind of want to um if somebody did it i would be pouncing on that retelling immediately because it is a very powerful story in fact I have her in lying in her cauldron on my wall literally right here um I don't know if I can angle my show you but yeah I just I think it's a really fascinating story all of the Welsh myths are fascinating so yeah I'd love someone to do that oh I can spell it yeah um uh, it's it's hideously yeah hideous to spell but her name is this I took a Celtic mythology class in, in college and we read the Mab, as we called it. It's an amazing stories in that text. I would love someone to do uh, a trans take on Bodoeth. I think there, there could be a lot there. 
Oh God, yes, yeah. Um, that the cauldron, um, the cauldron of Anun, like <laughs> people going in the cauldron, like uh, the idea of brewing, brewing a person from flowers. It, it, there's, a, I mean, the Welsh myths are full of shapeshifters. Um, actually, this is something I'm doing for book three, uh, which I've not sold yet, but hopefully you should hear some news about that soon because I'm I've just started writing it and I'm so excited and it's going to be Tam Lin uh, mixed with Welsh bardism, uh, which is also about like gender identity because there is so much cool stuff that's in uh, Celtic mythology and I just like fell in love with it while researching uh, the Wild Hunt book. So I, I just can't wait to like dissect it. <laughs> The Thank you. I, <laughs> I was just going to say that the minute I am asked a question like this, um, every specific name that I had been considering immediately flies from my head. Um, but I am going to say very generally, um, so I am not a poet as much as I wish I was. <laughs> um, but I think um, I think a lot about Arab Arabic poetry um, and how um, that is such a central form of storytelling in the Middle East and has been for a very long time. Um, so I would love to see something based off of that form of storytelling, um, whether it's poetry or some other form, just something that, you know, looks at those looks at that epic poetry um, and just refashions it in a new way. I would love to see an adaptation or a, a retelling or a reimagining of the Sunjata story, the the story, the sort of creation story of the Mali Empire in in Africa. Uh, I absolutely do not think I am the person to write this story, but I teach the Sunjata in my in my world lit class, and um, there's just an incredible amount of richness and interest and magic and and you know hope and betrayal and it's just an amazing story and it would and it would lend itself to a fantasy novel so beautifully but i absolutely think i'm the 100 percent wrong person to write it great so our next question is um do you try to craft your prose or sentences so that it has the same feel as your inspiration. Um, for example, a hard-boiled detective narrating a noir novel, or do you just let your own voice shine through? Uh, I'm going to jump in on this because I, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so the newest book, I tried to get some Kennings in there. If you know Anglo-Saxon Kennings, they're super, uh, yeah, they're just great. They're like Sail Road, uh, you know, it's like it's like a nice way of talking about you know ships and sailing and and like you just look them up. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, and I was like, I need to get as many Kennings in my new book as possible, um, just to like get the, you know, the kind of rhythm of uh, you know, like I'm I'm it's it's in a way it could just be like one of those giant um, you know, there's a whole bunch of scops in this as well, like Anglo-Saxon scolds and bards, um, and I and and I've got a reputation for uh, like writing about songs and ballads. So um, I'm also like really uh, weirdly perfectionist about some things. So um, after reading an essay by um, Nicola Griffith about um, Spear, uh, which is a fantastic little novella, um, she wrote about how when the characters were speaking in um, Brythonic, which is the precursor to Welsh and Cornish and Breton, that language, um, she was quite careful about what language they were speaking and what words she was picking, as opposed to them speaking in uh, Old English, like Anglo-Saxon language. And so I wanted to do some of this in, in Wild Hunt, um, in, the, in Song of the Huntress. So um, whenever uh, there, there's quite a lot of dialogue in Brythonic and I make sure I don't have any phrasal verbs at all. Now, nobody is going to notice this apart from me. <laughs> But like it's it's one of those minute like like line level details that it really pleases me. And I've spent all day today, I can tell everyone I've spent all day today uh, researching the best way to pronounce all my characters, old English names to give to the audiobook narrator. So we can be as uh, historically accurate as possible, even though it's a dead language, I know. But I shall be doing the same with my Welsh Bardism book. I'm learning Welsh. Uh, <laughs> 
for it. Um, and there's a lot of really cool things like the Welsh triads, which is, um, you know, certain poetic forms. So I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a nerd when it comes down to like linguistics and trying to get that sort of, uh, yeah, that level of, I don't know, I feel like it kind of comes through, like, even if you don't consciously notice it, you have to have me nerding on about it at you. Um, <laughs> it, I feel like it, it's true. It, it's true to the to the historical period. And it's true to what I'm, um, I'm trying to say as well. I love language. It's great. I actually have a story about that very quick. Um, I did the same thing. Um, I used a lot of the, the poetic um, devices that Old English poetry uses in, in Beowulf. I have alliteration, I have kennings, I have sejura, I have a strong stressed meter. Um, I, I specifically included those elements, um, mostly in the little, uh, the, the shorter chapters from the dragon's point of view. Um, I wanted her language to really ref to, like be uh, reflective of the original language of the poem itself, and um, and and like Lucy, I knew that you know my readers weren't necessarily going to pick up on this, but it was important for me for that to be in there. I actually use Old English words in um, uh, in the book. I have a glossary at the end with a pronunciation guide for my for my audio reader. But on a, on a review, uh, the first review on Amazon when the book first came out, uh, somebody wrote that they felt that the, the dragon chapters were just a little bit different because they almost sounded like they were lyrical. And I like literally cheered from my living room because I was like, oh my God, somebody actually did pick it up. Somebody actually did recognize that those moments are written differently. So people do, Lucy, people do get it. They do, <laughs> they do uh, recognize it. Thank you. I think I, when I was trying to render ancient Greek poetry in this space world, I also used alliteration and kennings and the uh, mirrored lines because it seemed like it worked. Uh, I'm so glad that we have some old English students here and professors. And I, I mean, I feel like having those little references that we, you know, may or may not um, assume someone else will get, it's really nice when that one person does get it. It's like, yes. <laughs> Especially because, um, I don't know, like when I write, I write for myself first. So like if I want to see those things in the story, then like it's just, you know, I, I get that personal satisfaction from it. And then if someone else notices those little, little details, I'm like, yes. Um, for me uh, with Stardust, um, because it is a, a love letter to oral storytelling, I actually have interludes in the story of the characters telling stories. Um, and it uses sort of a variation um, of a traditional once upon a time um, in Arabic. It's usually there was and was not is sort of the variation. Um, and again, there are like different, depending on the region, there are different variations of that. Um, but uh, my tales all began neither here nor there, but long ago. And so um, it does have a very different voice. Once you get into the interludes, um, it sort of enters that oral storytelling um, voice. Um, I worked really hard to make sure that those that that it felt that way, that it felt as if a character was delivering a story. Um, I think it was really interesting because you think about um, written storytelling and oral storytelling and how the words that we use, um, the tone, the pacing, it's all going to be very, very different. Um, when you think about a folktale or, you know, any kind of story that started as like an oral tale, um, they tend to, I don't want to say they always skim the surface, but it's very action level oriented. Um, you're not getting like a deep dive into these characters' heads. Um, so I was very aware of that framework when I was writing these tales. Um, I feel very lucky because as I was writing them, um, because the book was already rooted in this inspiration for oral storytelling, I just had a lot of fun with the voice. Um, so I wasn't, I didn't feel like I had to suffer <laughs> over my page. Um, the content, yes, the content was hard to nail down, but in terms of the voice, um, I just had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, in terms of like, should you let your own voice uh, shine through? I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that these voices that we put on are not our own voices. You know, they totally are. And, um, and I, I don't think, you know, I don't really put any uh, weight behind the idea that like a, a less more formal voice or a more American sounding voice is a more real authentic voice for us uh you know even that voice is a voice that we've learned we've learned to pair it other people 
great, amazing answers, everyone. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any more time for audience questions, but I do have one question that I myself would like to know that our um, glorious audience members asked. What is something that you have recently read or are currently reading that you have enjoyed or would recommend? I'm reading The Starling House by here. Alex Harrow, and it's being amazing. So I would definitely recommend Alex Harrow and everything she has ever written. Uh, I am always recommending The Spear Cuts Through Water. Uh, I, it's incredible talking of oral storytelling tradition. Everyone should read it. It was my favorite book of last year. Um, I'm taking a little break from fantasy right now and reading um, The Borrow Boyfriend Club by Paige Powers, which is a delightful little rom-com. Highly recommend it. <laughs> that one's on my TBR, actually. It's so fun. So cute. Oh, it's on mine now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am reading a lot of um, heroic Celtic poetry from the heroic age, but so I'm also just being sent, thank you Orbit, the proof of the next Emily Wilde book, the Encyclopedia of Fairies, uh, which I, I love the first book. This is, this is like a real... Um, you know, uh, I do a look here. I, I feel like I, I read quite a lot of heavy stuff and I, I just adore this book because we had Heather on our... Um, podcast breaking the glass slipper last year and all she had to say was uh like one of my characters is inspired by howl from howl's moving castle and i was like sign me up <laughs> i think she mentioned like jareth from labyrinth and howl and i was like what why haven't i read this book anyway i've started the second book and i think it's going to be just as fun as the first so yeah Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much, everyone, for joining us. That was an incredible conversation, and I definitely look forward to re-watching it myself, so I hope everyone else will share. Um, be sure to tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. That is October 27th um, for the next in our series, um, Creating Otherworldly Cultures. Thank you to our authors and thank you to all of our attendees. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Orbit Live event. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.